Hey, welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone had a good week. Um, <clears throat> just a quick announcement. Um, we will finish today, obviously, chapter nine and jump into chapter 10. Uh, as a reminder, next week is uh, spring break, so obviously no class. And then when you come back, we will have, you will have <laughs> waiting for you uh, exam number three, which covers seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so uh, any questions at this point about anything in general? Okay, well, let me continue where we left off with chapter, chapter nine, slide 16. Excuse me. We were talking about uh, acids in bases and just a rehash uh, about an acid in the base. Uh, point number one, there's two definitions for an acid in the base. There's the, the most common one is the Arrhenius definition. And that is where an acid is defined as any compound that will produce when dissolved in water in aqueous solution produces a proton. A proton, recall, is a, a hydrogen atom that has lost its electron. The Lewis dot structure for hydrogen is as follows. So one electron, that's the first element. And it's in group one, one valence electron. And they put it in group 1A uh, for a reason, because that hydrogen can lose that electron and produce a H plus, which is what we call a proton, which is indicative of the acidity. So anything that produces a proton when placed in solution is classified as a Arrhenius acid, okay? With respect to a base, Arrhenius base is any compound when dissolved in uh, aqueous solutions produces the hydroxide ion. That's the polyatomic ion. We check the periodic table, you'll see it there. It's an anion. And you, you will see that the majority of bases are ionic compounds, like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. These are ionic compounds, okay? Now, with respect to an acid that produces a proton, they are covalent compounds. They start out, for example, uh, hydrochloric acid, okay, normally is a covalent compound. Earlier, I stated that one of the main differences between a, a covalent compound and a ionic compound is when you put them in solution, in an aqueous solution, ionic compounds will dissociate. Some dissociate 100%, some dissociate not so much, much, much less. But nevertheless, all of them will dis dissociate to whatever ex ex extreme it depends on the solubility of that ionic compound, where they're 100% or much less. With respect to protons, they come from covalent compounds. And I stated that covalent compounds in general, when you put them in solution, they do not dissociate. Carbon dioxide does not dissociate when you place it in water. You put more water in water, it stays H2O. It does not dissociate. The only exception was acids. And acids, be the, nat the nature of the bee, so to speak, is they have a proton that will separate, that bond between hydrogen and chloride in this example, will separate and dissociate. We have strong acids, we have strong weak, weak acids. Okay, so we were talking about pH, and so as we put more pH in solution, more high protons in solution, the pH goes up. And if we start adding, and as the pH concentration drops, the hydroxide concentration increases, we increase the pH, okay? We introduce this con um, concentration unit, which is called molarity, Okay, and we do is we place it in brackets, but molarity start, has the unit of the capital M, which have units of moles per 
leader, okay? We don't know what moles is, but we will use moles. Moles is our common factor that we can use to go from apples to oranges, so to speak, okay? So we'll get back to that in, in, in time. And so the pH is a number that runs from zero to 14 with seven being neutral. And it's nothing more than a mathematical function of, of the concentration of either the, the proton concentration or the hydroxide concentration. So when the concentration of the proton is equal to the concentration of the hydroxide, we have a neutral pH, which is seven. Okay, when the hydrogen ion concentration is much greater than the hydroxide, the pH, the solution itself becomes acidic and there's degrees of acidity. There's a very strong acid and, you know, it ranges. It's, it's, it's a gradient of acidity. The same is true for something that's basic or another term uses alkaline. So when, when the concentration of the proton uh, hydroxide is greater is one way to word it. The other way to word it is when the proton concentration is less. You know, same thing. It's a basic solution. All right. So then brings us to this. I stated it's a mathematical calculation. That's all it is. On your, on your calculator, you have a log button, L-O-G. And if you know the concentration of your proton, you simply take, type in the concentration of your proton, either in decimal units or in scientific notation, either way. And then you hit the log button. Most, most calculators, they have the log button as the primary, but check your calculator. It could be a secondary function. So you may need to add, uh, hit the second button and then that log button. Well, what happens is when you take the log of that concentration, you end up with a negative value. And that is why you multiply it by a negative one. So you're always gonna have a positive number. So if you have a concentration, proton concentration of 0.1 or 10 to the negative one, and you take the log of that, you end up with a number of negative one. Well, negative one times negative one obviously gives you a positive value. Okay. So it's a negative log of the proton concentration. If you have the pH and you want to go and calculate um, the concentration of the proton, you just invert it. And you do is you have a button where it's uh, on your calculator says 10 to the X power. And what you do is you type in the pH, you actually type in the negative of the pH, okay? And then you hit that, uh, well, you do 10, you hit the 10 to the X button and then you type in negative, uh, in this case, negative one. And that gives you a value that would be 0.1. So that's going back to concentration. All right, so if the concentration is 10 to the negative one or 0.1 molars, our pH is a uh, one, okay? You'll start to see a little trend here. If you're dealing with a 10 to the negative fifth con uh, concentration moles per liter, our pH would be simply a five, okay? And so when we're dealing with, you know, exponents of 10 to the X value, it's simply the, the exponent value, okay? But that's not always the case. Sometimes you may be dealing with a number like, I don't know, let's say, 2.5 times 10 to the negative third uh, concentration. Well, in that case, it's not a simple, you know, a pH of three. You got to type in the whole number 2.5 times 10 to the negative three and then hit the log. Okay. But when it's not, it's just increments of 10 to the X power. It's uh, pretty straightforward as far as what the pH value is. So. 10 to the negative eight molar or moles per liter, the pH would simply be an eight. Okay, notice, notice uh, the trend here. As the proton concentration gets smaller and weaker, okay, 
10 to the negative 8 is a much, much, much smaller number than 10 to the negative 1. So 10 to the negative 1 is fairly acidic, pretty strong. But as that concentration gets smaller, our pH goes up. And now the hydroxide ion concentration is increasing and becomes a more of a pH value of the pH, a more of a, a, a basic value. Okay. Here, 10 to the negative third, obviously we, we're back to a acidic solution. Okay, kind of my weak acidic solution. And then uh, we can either type it in scientific, scientific notation, one times 10 to the negative third, or type it in as point in decimal form, 0 0.001, and we get the same value. Okay. This one here, uh, put it in decimal form or recognize it or convert it to decimal. Uh, scientific notation, 10 to a negative 8, its pH will be an 8. Okay. So with respect to pH values, uh, here's a listing of, of some common pH values to give an idea of uh, <laughs> how acidic or alkaline alkaline is a material is vomit obviously it can be acidic uh, because the stomach we have hydrochloric acid very very uh, low ph and so it's coming up uh, it burns your esophagus because the tissues in your esophagus are not made like the tissues in your stomach to protect itself lemon juice they say 2.2 coffee that ranges a little bit saliva it depends on, on, on your diet actually but it's roughly neutral blood very crucial ph roughly about 7.3 to 7.4 slightly alkaline milk and magnesia about 10.5 very alkaline uh, urine again that depends on, on one's diet and so forth but around six it's slightly acidic and then uh, a lot of soda pops are around two to three, maybe four, and root beer, which when I first saw this, I was kind of surprised. It's uh, uh, about uh, not less acidic, it's 5.5. Uh, back then, uh, when I was teaching in Kansas City, I was teaching analytical chemistry, which is the type of chemistry where you do a lot of measurements of whatever, you know, multiple things. One of the things we did was measure the pH of water in the area. And so I had students bring in water samples from home. We did pH, and I was relatively surprised, and we plotted it on the map. But in the Kansas City area, we had pHs of water that varied from alkaline, you know, eight, all the way down to almost to acidic acid, about three to four. Uh, on average, they were slightly acidic, somewhere about uh, six to seven. Okay, but it was, that was quite interesting. So I don't know what it is here. Uh, and I, I, I probably will vary from, from area to area. Okay, buffers. Well, what exactly is a buffer? Very straightforward. A buffer is simply a system of chemicals that you put together so that it maintains a specific pH value, okay? And so if you have a pH of a buffer of, let's say, seven, neutral, and you want to maintain that seven, where you have a system of chemicals in, the, in there, in your, in your uh, buffer solution, so that when an acid comes into the environment, okay, the base part of the buffer system will react with that acid to neutralize it and maintain that seven. Or alternatively, if a base comes into the system, the acid part of the buffer system would react with the base to maintain that buffer. Very classical buffer is our blood system. Very crucial uh, to maintain a buffer is pH around 7.4 for a lot of uh, uh, bodily functions to operate properly in, within our system, within our body. And so we are always uh, trying to maintain that pH. A variety of, of chemicals are in there. Carbon dioxide is a big factor in that. And maintain a pH. So basically, it's all it is. Buffer is to maintain a pH constant. Okay. Now, I started this uh, conversation with the definition of the heinous acid and the heinous base. Okay. And so we have a chemical reaction here. 
there's an introduction to chemical reactions, right? And so you take a look at this and you might ask yourself, all right, well, how do I know that I'm dealing with an acid? Now note the fact that we're dealing with the definition of an arrhenius acid. And so therefore we are looking for chemicals that will produce the proton and the hydroxide ion when it's placed in solution, okay? in an aqueous solution. And so we had talked about this particular one. One thing to note is, notice the way it's written. Normally you got, you got the H first, okay? That's a good indication that possibly you're dealing with an acid, okay? Not 100% not of the time, 99% of the time, at least at Chem 130, you see hydrogen ring first, that's a good indi indication. You know what, I got an acid here. You know, notice this, the acids we've been talking about. We dealt with hydrochloric acid. We dealt with uh, sulfuric acid. Okay. We even dealt with acetic acid. I won't give the, the formula, but we had hydrogen here. And notice the hydrogen is written first. So that is a good indication that we have a hydrogen coming up. So I look over to the right, to the right of hydrogen. And I have this NO3, which if you think about it for a second, that's reminiscent of the nitrate ion, okay? Nitrate ion. And what's happened is this, the nitrate ion is initially came from this acid or nitric acid, okay? Because the, um, the acid, as a proton which reacted the base to form the nitrate ion. There is on the right hand side, it's one of the products. So that, if I say, if I look and I recognize NO3 is the nitrate, okay, and this is along the, the, the one of the papers that gave you a nomenclature about taking that salt and putting that proton back, and guess what? It now becomes nitric acid. Okay, nitric acid. And so obviously the HNO2, NO3 is the acid, the arrhenius acid, because when we put nitric acid in solution, it will produce a proton. All right, well, if that, if we figure that part out, then what must be True then is, since we're talking about acids and bases, the other reactant must be the base. To verify that, I look at the parentheses. I got a polyatomic ion. Remember, polyatomic ions are, are written with a parentheses if I need more than one, okay? I got two of them here. And OH, you, know, you might ask yourself, well, I'm not sure what that is. Well, you go to the polyatomic ion table, on the periodic table, you look for OH, you'll find OH negative, and that's called a hydroxide ion. Then we got calcium hydroxide. Okay, so therefore, the base, the arrhenius base, is the calcium hydroxide. Now, something else about this reaction here. When a proton, one proton, reacts with one hydroxide ion to give you one molecule of water. That is what we call a, the stoichiometric relationship. That is the ratio between reactants. How many of A do I need to, give, to react with B to give me whatever product I have? It's understood that there's a one there, okay? So one proton plus one hydroxide gives me one water. That is the ratio there, one to one. If we look at the nitric acid, we have two nitric acids there. You might ask yourself, well, why is it we have two? Well, I want to neutralize, this is the neutralization reaction. So I want to neutralize all of the acid with enough base. And notice the hydroxide has two, there are two hydroxides. Okay, so if I were to write this out in ionic form, I will have two protons 
reacting with two hydroxides. And guess what? I'm going to make two waters. Okay, you see that? And then, of course, I have the salt because it's an acid base reaction. I have the salts that come together. They are spectators. They're, they're not the, 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 the ones that are anything's really happening. The ones that are actually being written and uh, are reacting is the proton and the hydroxide. And those are being reacting with each other to form water. Okay. And then we have the salt here which is again, ionic compound, which is the calcium and the nitrate, okay? So what we have here is an example of what we call a balanced chemical reaction. This is balanced. We have to, we are governed by the, cons the law of conservation of matter that says, if I start off with whatever number of atoms as reactants, I'm going to have the same number of, of atoms at the end when I make new products. And so if you, if you can check for yourself, you'll see here that I have two hydrogens from the nitric acid and two hydrogens from the hydroxide. That's a total of four hydrogens in the reactant site. Okay. We look at the product site. I have four hydrogens because I have two molecules of water, I have four hydrogens there. So guess what? The hydrogens are balanced. There's still hydrogen, either in the form of a proton or in the form of in hydroxide. And they get changed to now become hydrogens in the form of water, okay? Still hydrogen, one proton. Calcium, we got one calcium here as a reactant. And guess what? We have one calcium is a product. So calcium is balanced. What's left is the nitrate, the nitrate, excuse me. There's two of them. Well, there are two nitrates here. You see, because there's two in front of nitric acid. So the nitrates are balanced, okay? One suggestion when you're dealing with polyatomic ions and you wanna balance your equation, which we're gonna talk at length in the next chapter is, yeah, Treat the nitrate as a unit and just say, I got two nitrates rather than having to count how many nitrogens, how many oxygens. It's much easier to treat it as a unit. So I got two nitrates on the left, two nitrates on the right. Okay? So maybe one way to do this is to actually put everything in ionic form so you can see how things balance out. So I got two nitric acids that when I put in solution, I form the following ions, okay? I got two nitrates, two protons. I got one calcium, it's a plus two, and I have two hydroxides. When those get in solution, okay? Now, when the reaction proceeds, I make two waters, okay? Plus, I make one calcium is still there, and I make two nitrate. So you can see here that uh, all, how's every, how everything's separated and everything's accounted for. I got two nitrates over here, two nitrates over here, one calcium over here, one calcium over here. Okay, I have. Uh, I, my, my protons, two protons, and my two hydroxides create for two waters. So everybody is, is balanced. And Mother Nature is happy. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is important when it comes to balancing equations because why is this? Our next step, notice we have, we have started from the periodic table. We, we looked at the atoms. Then we talked about how the atoms form ions, either by losing or gaining electrons. Then we start put, putting these ions and anions, uh, cations and anions together to make compounds, okay? And now these compounds are reacting with each other in some chemical reaction, of which 
we're going to learn there's only six types of chemical reactions. This is one of them. This is a neutralization reaction. We're neutralizing the acid and the hydroxide. Okay. And now we react in, we're, we are reacting compounds with each other to form products. The next step is to do calculations of these reactions. And therefore, you could, for example, start off with, let's say, 10 grams of nitric acid and be asked to determine how many grams of calcium nitrate are formed, okay? And you need to know to have a balanced chemical equation because this is a two-to-one ratio between the nitric acid and the calcium nitrate. Or what happens a lot in, in, in uh, industry and out there in chemistry, real life, so to speak, chemistry, is you're trying to make an X amount of products. And so you may be asked to figure out, well, I need to make, let's say, 100 grams of calcium nitrate for whatever reason. I need to know how many grams of nitric acid I need to start off with to make that amount of calcium nitrate. And that could be 100 grams, or it could be 100 tons. That same chemical reaction occurs, whether it's a lab scale or industrial, large, very large scale, same reaction. OK, enough of that. We'll get a lot more of that in the subsequent chapter. All right, we know about the calcium. It's plus two, we get the net two nitrates, right? All right, now, with respect to drawing diagrams to represent either strong acids or weak bases, strong bases, et cetera, uh, we need, you might be given something like this, draw pictures like uh, beaker diagrams of assuming let's take all these chemicals we're given and put them into an aqueous solutions and describe what happened. Well, the first thing I need to know is I need to define them as to be either a strong acid or a strong base or a weak acid and a weak base, okay? The other aspect that we're gonna learn now is whether an ionic compound is soluble in water and we're gonna use what we call the solubility table. Okay, we'll be able to, given the formula, we'll be able to predict whether that material is soluble or insoluble using the, the solubility table of the, on the periodic table. Let me call that up. We're gonna have more on that here in a bit. So if you look at your periodic table on the bottom right side, there are, there's another little table. There's a lot of information on the periodic table we supply called the solubility rules, okay? We'll be able to look at the uh, ionic compound given and determine whether uh, that ionic compound is either soluble or insoluble. Now, notice the, the something here, We're either dealing with something that's soluble or insoluble. When we say soluble, that means that literally 100% of it dissociates in solution, making it into what we call a strong electrolyte. You all heard the term when you take your drink, get a keep up of your electrolytes. All electrolytes are, are cations and anions. All, all they are are the atoms that have gained or lost electrons. Electrolytes are important in our body. Without them, we couldn't conduct electricity. And if you can't conduct electricity, then our nerve, our, our, our uh, signals from our toe to the brain wouldn't be uh, capable. Okay? And then we have the either classified as inside. Now, insoluble does not mean that it's totally insoluble. That just means that like a weak acid or weak base that we talked about, that we'll talk about, if it's weak, that means that a little bit of the ions go in solution and not so much a lot like soluble. The bulk of it is still intact and actually forms a precipitate if it's in an aqueous solution, okay? Classic example at home, if you have milk or magnesia, pour some in a glass, you'll see it's cloudy. If you let it set there by itself, it's going to separate because the magnesium compound in there is very, is classified as insoluble. Some of it's in solution, but the bulk of it is, is not, and it's actually a 
it's solid. So what you gotta do, you gotta shake it up a little bit to get, form an emotion and be able to drink that. All right, so we have the list here. We have to classify it as weak or strong. It helps us to determine what kind of picture we're gonna draw. All right, so HNO4, recall that that was a strong acid. It's one of the strong acids we, we gave you, okay? HF, notice the hydrogen again. We got hydrogen, it's an acid. This one was a weak acid, okay? We gave you potassium hydroxide and classified that as a strong base. Now, now with the solubility table, you'll see why it's a strong base because it is soluble. It's classified as being soluble and therefore 100% approximately dissolved. And that's why it's a strong base. We classified magnesium hydroxide as a weak base. We just gave it to you and said, that's a weak base. But now again, with the solubility table, you will see the, the magnesium hydroxides are classified as insoluble, which again means that, there, yes, there's a little bit in solution, but the bulk of it is uh, a precipitate, a solid that falls to the bottom of the beaker or container that has the magnesium hydroxide. Okay, so we define them so we can have a better idea of what kind of picture uh, we're going to draw. And so being a strong acid, roughly 100% is going to dissociate into the ions. Uh, here, you know, 5% for HF, maybe less than 5%, which means that we're just going to draw maybe one set of ions in solution and the rest we're going to draw them, but keep them together. Okay, potassium hydroxide, 100% of them will be in ionic form. And magnesium hydroxide, because it's a weak base, again, less than 5% goes in solution. And as the case of HF, we will only draw maybe one set of ions in solution with the bulk of it still together. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. All right, so the first one. Nitric acid. Okay, we classified that as a strong acid. So that means if I need to draw a diagram of nitric acid in an aqueous solution, it will be uh, drawn with all ions separate. Okay, none of them recombine. And so don't forget, you know, do about you know three or four pairs of ions, but don't forget the charges. And make sure that if I put, if I use three pair of protons, that I have three counter anions, okay? And they're dissociated 100%. Okay, so that's a very strong, strong acid, very strong uh, electrolyte. And that would conduct uh, electricity very strongly. See, that's what, that's what is, we'll have an example of that in a second. All right, so HF we classified as a weak base, excuse me, a weak acid. And so at the most, just draw at least one set of ions, okay? And the rest are all combined. They're still intact, they're just floating around in there in the solution but we have you know, one set of ions. And that would demonstrate that it is a weak acid. We know it's an acid, why? Because there's a proton there, just like the nitric acid. But uh, only one set designates it as a weak acid. Potassium hydroxide, we're gonna explain even further when we get to the few more slides about the solubility rules. You'll notice, but I, I will introduce it here. See down in, down here in solubility rules number one, you see the cations, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium, the ones with the positive charge. When those four are bonded to anything else, doesn't make a difference what it is. It is soluble, all right? Classified as soluble. Couple is a big four there, the big four cations. 
does not make a difference what is bonded the anion can be. The fact that you got lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium tells you that it is 100% soluble, therefore makes it into a strong electrolyte. And so everything's 100% dissociated, we draw it like we did the, the, uh, the strong acid. And again, don't forget the charges on the anions and don't forget to have the correct number of pairs of cation and anion. Here we got three cations and three anions. Okay. Now, the next one is the magnesium hydroxide, which we defined to you earlier and said that is a, an example of a weak base. We know it's a base because it has the hydroxide ion. And we know it's weak now because we're going to talk about it in detail here in a second. But if you look at number 10 on the right-hand side of the solubility rules, you'll find that hydroxides are classified as insoluble unless they are bonded to number one, the big four, or calcium, barium, and strontium. So that means that there's only seven examples of hydroxide compounds. Let me, let me repeat that. There's only seven examples of hydroxide compounds that are soluble in water. Everybody else is insoluble, okay? Insoluble. And so we draw it being insoluble, again, doesn't mean that there are no ions in solution. It just means we draw at least one set of ions. And so here we, we draw, we draw, oh, sorry. We draw uh, one set of, uh, here's a magnesium ion, and then we get two hydroxide ions in solution, okay? The bulk of the rest of the material is sitting on the bottom of the beaker and as follows and intact. It's a solid. So this big old chunk of material designates it solid that precipitated down to the bottom of the beaker, okay? All right, so let me clearly mess up a little bit. So that's how we, we draw uh, aqueous diagrams of specific compounds, define whether it's strong or weak, or soluble or insoluble, and then that tells you how you're gonna draw it. Either gonna show the ions completely dissociated, if it's strong, or show the ions with at least one pair, one set of ions in, in, in solution, and then the other ones are intact, okay? All right, to summarize all this with respect to acids and bases, our heinous acids are compounds that make protons in solution, okay? Protons. And they generally come from covalent compounds. Okay. Our heinous bases are solutions, compounds, I should say, that produce hydroxide. And they come from ionic compounds, like a metal and hydroxide combination. Okay. Now, with respect to brownsted acids in bases, uh, the acid of uh, the Brassilari acid, basically the same as the Arrhenius acid, because what it's doing is something that produces or loses a proton. Okay. They kind of, they're very similar in, in their definition. Where they differ is how a Brassilari defines a proton. And that is any chemical that will accept or gain that proton. Okay. And does it mean that? Uh, with brown cell Lowry, it encompasses other species, other compounds out there that have nothing to do with hydroxide. In general, they ha have lone pair of electrons that will uh, tie up that proton, like ammonia, and producing the ammonium ion. Strong acids, because they're strong, means that they dissolve 100%, so they ionize dissociate, they break apart 100%, approximately. Weak acids, much, much less, okay? Uh, strong bases, because they're soluble, 
they generally come from ionic compounds, dissociate 100%. You know, uh, when, when for Chem 130, when we work with acids and bases, generally what we're talking about are the protons and the hydroxides. We don't do too much on Brown's and Lowry. We just have to learn about why, it's, what's their definition. But it, once you move up in chemistry, 151, 152, we get more involved with the Brown's and Lowry definition. Okay. So, and buffers. Buffers, all they do is main, maintain the pH, okay? That's their sole function. All right, well, let us continue here. Uh, this, this is basically why so pH is very important. Well, uh, here's some pH values of a variety of different soda pumps in them. Uh, Quite, quite acidic. And the one down the most acidic looks like RC Cola to almost 2.4, very acidic. Anyway, you gotta be careful because too much acidity can cause damage for your dental, give you dental problems. Okay, which brings us to the solubility rules. And basically solubility is just simply defined as the amount of solute dissolved in a given amount of salt. The solute is the amount of whatever you can dissolve in some kind of solvent. Here, we are talking about aqueous systems, strictly aqueous systems. Now, solubility is a function of temperature. You may may not know this, but if you have a, you know, if you have a solution and you try and dissolve more material into it, you know, at room temperature, it may not dissolve a lot. So what, is, what do people do? They heat it up. Okay, if you heat something up, you get more material in solution. Okay, so the solubility rules is, is a function of temperature. And so to make sure there's no ambiguity, we deal with a set temperature. So when we talk about solubility, we are talking about basically room temperature, 25 degrees. Okay, 25 degrees. Now, you might say, well, how does that temperature work? Well, think about it, iced tea. You know, I like iced tea, sugar iced tea. I put a little sugar in it. If I have more sugar, it won't dissolve. It, it settles at the bottom of the container. There's an X amount of sugar I can put in there. But if I heat that up to make hot tea, guess what? That sugar goes in there, okay? All right, so temperature, we're gonna be dealing with, with uh, uh, 25 degrees. It's going to be classified once we determine as soluble. That means that the ionic compound basically dissolves 100%, 99.9%, okay? Nothing's ever 100%. And what we do to designate it as soluble, we use the physical state of A, Q, in parentheses. Remember that? We had S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, and, and, and AQ for aqueous. That tells you that it is dissolved. It's in a water solution. Okay. If it is defined as insoluble based on the, on the solubility rules, and then its physical state would designate it as S, it's a solid. Yes, I know there's some ions in solution, but it's very minimal, okay? So overall, we, we designate it, its physical state is, is a solid. All right, let me clear this up here. All right, so let's, let's talk about the solubility rule given here. Okay, this, this is the same rules that are shown on the, on the uh, periodic, periodic table. They may differ a little bit as far as the numbering sequence where it starts off with six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 on the right side, but basically is broken up into two columns. We have the soluble, soluble column and the insoluble column. Okay, number one, here's the big four I just mentioned. These are the cations of lithium ion, sodium ion, potassium ion, and ammonium ion. And so when you look at the formula and you got lithium sitting up front or, or sodium or potassium or, or ammonium, 
100%, whatever doesn't make a difference, what follows. It's 100, it is soluble, classified as soluble. So uh, potassium chloride, soluble. Potassium sulfate, potassium or sodium sulfate, all soluble, okay? Number two, this is the acetate anion. And so it's a negative charge, it's the anion. So any cation, any cation that is bonded with the acetate ion is soluble, 100%. Copper acetate, soluble. Potassium, obviously, soluble. And magnesium acetate, soluble, okay? Number three, the same is true for the nitrate. Any cation that nitrate is, is, is combined with is defined as soluble in aqueous solution. So copper acetate, iron acetate, et cetera, okay, soluble. All right, the halides, the halide ions, specifically chloride, bromide, and iodine. Normally, like number, like the acetate and the nitrate, they are soluble. There's an exception of three. When those halides are combined with silver or mercury or lead, what we call the heavy metal, those three examples are insoluble, okay? And so you gotta be careful, you see a halide, Make sure if it's combined with the, with silver, mercury, lead, it's insoluble. Otherwise, all the other thousands of halide compounds or uh, ionic compounds are soluble, okay? Same is true with the sulfate, number five. The sulfates normally are soluble 100% of the time, with the exception of these five. When you have calcium sulfate, involved or strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, silver sulfate, or lead sulfate, those five examples are insoluble, okay? All the other thousands of sulfates are soluble. Okay. So the, to, re, to rehash here, number one, those four, the big four, regardless of what's bonded to them, whatever anion is bonded, anion is bonded to those four, always 100% soluble. Acetate and nitrate, two and three, whatever cation is bonded to them, soluble, okay? The halides, normally same, similar scenario, with the exception of three compounds. That is when those halides are bonded to silver, mercury, or lead. Those, in those cases, they are insoluble, okay? Sulfates, similar. All the cations is bonded to makes it soluble, except when it's bonded to calcium, strontium, barium, silver, or lead. Five, five examples of sulfates that are classified as insoluble. Every, everyone else is soluble, okay? Any questions about the soluble column? Well, let's talk about the insoluble column. Okay, number one. Normally, every, regardless, uh, when we look at the carbonate, the chromate, one, two, and three. When we look at these three anions, okay? These three anions, regardless of the cation it's attached to, it is classified insoluble with the exception of if they're bonded to the big four, okay? So in each case, there's four carbonate ions, four chromate ions, four phosphate ions, or let me restate that, sorry about that. There are four uh, metal carbonate compounds, four metal chromate compounds, 
for metal phosphate compounds that are soluble, okay? And, the, and if those four metal compounds are either uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonia, that makes them soluble. That means that everybody else, all others, all other anions are insoluble. Okay. All right. Let's look at the sulfide ion. The sulfide ion, again, normally is insoluble. However, there are seven examples that the sulfide is soluble. Obviously, if they're bonded to the big four, it makes them soluble. But along three other ones are if the sulfides are bonded to calcium, strontium, or barium. So there are seven examples of, of insoluble, uh, excuse me, seven examples of soluble compounds, sulfide compounds, okay, seven. Everybody else is inside. Okay. And finally, we have the same scenario with the hydroxide. If the hydroxides are bonded with the big four, they're soluble. But on top of that, if it's bonded with calcium, strontium, and barium, okay, they're also soluble. Again, so we have seven examples of soluble hydroxide compounds. And then all the other compounds out there are insoluble, okay? Which is a property that I use, utilize quite a bit. Uh, one of my functions back in my days of research was uh, to make sure our chemicals that we created in our company were not being trashed and sent into the uh, uh, waste disposal in the drain. And so we were required to make sure, because we used a lot of iron and, and uh, copper, we needed to have a technique that we can treat that iron and copper to cause a precipitate, which then we filtered out. And the water that went down the drain in, in the area we worked at was cleaner <laughs> than the water coming into the tap. So, because the rules, it's really weird. You know, the rules of what you could dispose is much more uh, uh, stricter than the waters that you can bring in from the, from the water company. Uh, I don't understand that. Anyway, the water was very, very clean. So any questions about the insoluble side? Huh? All right, so now we're given here some uh, examples of uh, compounds that we need to determine whether they're soluble or insoluble in the aqueous solution, okay? And the first thing I can do when I look at a list like this, I look, at the, look for the big four, okay? And I see sodium there, and I see potassium there. The fact that they're one of the big four tells me automatically, no matter what follows, it is soluble, okay? And so we got sodium sulfide, which is soluble, hence we designate it with the AQ in parentheses, subscript AQ, okay? Aluminum hydroxide, well, let's, let's break it down. Here's the hydroxide. This is why it's important to recognize the ions because you're using the ions to help you determine whether they're soluble or not. It's a parenthesis, so that tells you I've got a polyatomic ion, I've got an OH, and then I go to the polyatomic ion table. That tells me I got OH, that tells me it's a hydroxide. All right. So I go to the solubility table now. Hydroxides are right here. Normally, hydroxides are insoluble. Okay unless they are bonded to the four, or we got calcium, strontium, or barium, okay? So there's seven examples of soluble hydroxide compounds. Everybody else is insoluble. Aluminum is not part of that list. 
So aluminum hydroxide would be insoluble. So therefore we put S to show it's insoluble. Bear in mind, if we needed to draw a diagram of this aluminum hydroxide and aqueous solution, we need to at least put in one set of, of uh, ions in solution, and then the bulk of it down at the bottom is a precipitate. Okay, um, the next one we got silver bromide. Bromide, so let's look for bromide. Bromide is a halide, okay? It's over here, number four, on the soluble side, okay? So normally we would think, okay, soluble, but that's not the case because normally it is the case, but unless that bromide, that halide is bonded to those, the heavy metals, that's insoluble. It's bonded to silver. So that makes silver bromide as classified as insoluble. So we put it with an S, okay? Okay, let me clear up my mess a little bit here. And then we have CaCO3. Well, it's carbonate. It's important that we recognize the polyatomic ions, carbonate, okay? We look for carbonate on the solubility rules. Normally it is uh, insoluble, so we could say that, but we have to double check to make sure that the partner is not part of the big four, which obviously calcium is not, okay? So that means that calcium carbonate is classified as insoluble and therefore we designate the S. Um, Sometimes you might see on some of your water faucets is solid scum material or maybe have a ring around the tub. That's what you're looking at. That's calcium carbonate, especially if you got heavy water at home. Okay. And then the last one, we realize we got we got the potassium up front. You don't have to go any further. The fact that you got potassium tells you you're dealing with the big four, always soluble. And so Potassium nitrate is always soluble. The counter of that, okay, if you didn't recognize that, is what? Look at the nitrate. Look at number three for nitrates. Nitrates are, regardless of who the cation is, is always soluble. So, you know, KNO3 is a double whammy. One is part, potassium is part of the big four, and then you got the nitrate, which by itself is soluble. Okay, so it's, Totally, totally soluble. Okay. Right. Any questions about how we came about here? Okay, we, we broke it down, hopefully stepwise, and you see what we did. All right, which brings us to electrolytes. And, and as I mentioned earlier, electrolytes are nothing more than these atoms that either have, uh, that have uh, a charge on them. They have either positive or negative, okay? And when something is strong, when it's a strong electrolyte, okay? That means they're good conductors of electricity. That means that they're a strong acid or a strong base. Okay, any of the ionic compounds that are classified as soluble makes it a strong electrolyte. Because okay. if I have, you know, 10 atom, uh, 10 uh, units of, of the compound, I'm going to break up all 10. I'm going to have 10 ions of cations and 10 an anions. So I'm going to have a lot of uh, ions in solution that carry that electrical, electrical charge. So Compared to something that's weak, I mean, I would not have that many ions in solution, so I can't carry that much electrical charge. Non-electrolytes. Normally, with the exception of acids, which are covalent compounds, but normally all covalent compounds do not break up, they do not dissociate, and therefore are non-electrolytes. They don't conduct electricity, okay? Water does water, pure 100% water does not conduct electricity. What could, if, if you have uh, water at home and you say, well, no, I conduct electricity. Yes, that's true because water at home has ions 
has sodium and calcium and carbonates and all kinds of ions in solution, they carry that charge. But pure 100% water, there are no ions in it. It does not carry a charge and therefore are not conducting. Okay. Now, if you had a bathtub full of pure 100% water and you stuck your, your uh, hair dryer in there, you'll be safe for a little bit. No electricity. No, you won't get charged until the ions that are in our body that we just, you know, we perspire every day. We have ions in your body. They get into the water. Now you better get out of the tub because now it will conduct electricity. Okay, don't do this at home. I'm just telling you. Sugar, sugars, CHH1206. That's the general formula. It's okay. You don't know what it is, but do recognize that it's in covalent compound because all you have is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, no metals in there. And therefore, covalent compounds, and it's not an acid. Okay, therefore, it's a non conductor simply because there are no ions. Okay. And then finally, with respect to weak electrolytes, those are the weak acids, the weak bases, any of the ionic compounds that have been classified as insoluble. They will conduct electricity, but because they're insoluble, only a small amount of electrolytes in solution. And so they will not um, uh, have a lot of charge. You know, there are things like, for example, if you do home testing in your water, there's little instruments you can purchase called conductivity, little instrument, and you insert it into the liquid. And uh, what that does is, you know, there's a current that runs through the electrode. So if you have, if we had that, had a little, has a little LED readout, and I put it into a solution that had a strong electrolyte, that LED would, would light up very strongly, be very bright, because there's a lot of ions in solution, okay? The non-electrolyte, number two, that LED wouldn't light up at all, because there's no ions in solution. There's no closing of the circuit, if you will. These ions are like flipping the switch on your electricity to turn the light on. Now, you don't have ions, the switch is in the off position. Now, the weak electrolytes, it will switch the, the, the light on, but because there are not a lot of ions in solution, that LED readout on that instrument would be dim, okay? It'd be dim, it'd be there, it will conduct electricity, but it'd be a dim light. Simply because the magnitude, the number of ions in solution is very small. So uh, to summarize, this table tells you everything, strong electrolytes, we've got a strong acid, strong base, any com ionic compound that has been classified as a soluble, which constitutes a strong base because strong bases normally are ionic compounds. So that our uh, strong base is normally based on solubility or soluble. And so by default, there's strong electrolyte. Weak electrolytes would be a weak acid, which we gave you a list of some of the weak acid, and a weak base or any ionic compound that is insoluble, classified as insoluble. And then obviously non-electrolytes are all covalent pound, uh, compounds with the exception of acids. Acids, HCl, sulfuric acid, they're covalent compounds, but they're very specific covalent compounds that when they're put in solution, a proton is, is produced, okay? Because they're acid. Uh, the electrolytes here, uh, this kind of shows you uh, a picture of I had a beaker with two electrodes and I have electrolytes, it's gonna close the circuit and electricity will run through, okay? That's the function that our electrolytes are on our body. When we're sending electrical signals to our, our brain and to our body, you stump your toe, there's an electrical signal that goes all the way up from, from the toe all the way up to uh, your brain to tell you, ouch, and you hurt your toe. But these signals are, are, are sent by ions, okay? Non-electrolytes, to demonstrate graphically, is shown as follows. 
uh, there are no charges in there, and therefore we get no no electricity. We don't close the circuit. Okay, no ions in there. No, no electricity being run through the system. Okay, now. Looking at diagrams, either we've been asked to draw diagrams of a compound or to determine whether they're strong, weak, or not. Well, we look at the diagram. Any, we see that magnesium hydroxide, we talked at length about that. It's an ionic compound. Okay. Um, therefore, uh, being an ionic compound is classified as insoluble. Now you're asked, well, what do I have HF, like hydrofluoric acid? Why isn't that down at the bottom of the beak? Well, that's because uh, weak acids are still, they're just floating in solution. They're not forming precipitates, okay? Only the ionic compounds are the ones that are forming the precipitate, at least for chem 130, okay? And so uh, uh, insoluble, by classification means that then the bulk of the magnesium hydroxide is down at the bottom of the container. And we put in at least one set of ions, negative and positive ions. So this would be an example of a weak base, okay? Weak base, simply because we know that magnesium hydroxide will produce hydroxide, which by definition makes it a base, but it's a weak base because of the solubility of it in water. It's ins insoluble, classified as insoluble, and therefore not many ions in solution. The next one in the middle, uh, we may not know what it is, but that's okay. Look at, look at the, the elements involved. We got carbon and hydrogen. That's all we got in there, nothing else in there. So this is an example of a covalent compound. And it's just sitting in there. This is, for example, this is methane. Actually, it's a formula for methane. It's been bubbled through some aqueous solution and uh, they're non conductors. And then we look at the last one is potassium chloride. Notice that we got potassium, so automatically soluble. Okay, which means that. Uh, all the ions are separated, all of them, because it's totally dissociated. And if you need to draw this, make sure you put the correct number of pairs of anion and cation in there. You don't need to add that many, just you know, three to four pairs, that'd be good. All right, so. So before I forget, so this would be a strong, strong electrolyte. Potassium chloride would be a strong electrolyte. The one in the middle, CH4, would be a non-electrolyte. And obviously, magnesium hydroxide would be a weak one because of its uh, uh, lack of solubility in aqueous solution. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we could be given a list there and they're asking to classify uh, these as either strong, weak, or a non-electrolyte, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the, the answer and then we're going to talk about it. All right, so number one is barium sulfide, okay? We got an ionic compound, barium sulfide, so that sends us to the solubility rules. Okay? And if you look up the sulfide, you'll find it to find it that barium sulfide is classified as soluble. Being classified as soluble makes it a strong electrolyte. Okay. All right. Next one, number two. Silver chloride, chloride. Well, that sends you to, they should send you to the halides on the solubility column, okay? On the, on the soluble column, I should say. And normally halides are soluble unless they're bonded to those heavy metals of which silver is one of them in this case. So that means that silver chloride is insoluble. 
which makes it into a weak electrolyte. We also use this as, as a tool, you know, if you, you ever need your water tested and you want to find out how many, if you got any chlorides in there, this is one test, you take silver nitrate, which is an aqueous solution, clear. You take your water sample and you put a little bit of both and eat it together, mix it together. If you got chlorides, guess what? You get a precipitate, it gets cloudy. That's a good indication that you have halides in your water. It's not very specific, but it tells you that halides because we know that silver halides are insoluble. All right, number three, right off the bat, you got potassium. Don't have to go any further, okay? The fact that you got potassium, part of the big four, classifies it as soluble and it's strong because it's soluble. If you don't remember that, also don't know that, no, no, notice that nitrates are also soluble with whatever it's bonded to. So it's potassium nitrate has a double whammy. You got potassium makes it soluble. You got nitrate makes it soluble. Okay. Number four, we got H2. Okay, that's a good indication that I'm dealing with an acid here. Okay, we got hydrogen written first. In fact, it is. If you look at this, this is one of the acids we gave you and classified it as a weak acid. So this is carbonic acid, H2CO4. And being a weak acid makes it a weak electrolyte, okay? Number five, CO2, carbon dioxide. There's no metals in here. This is a covalent compound. Being a covalent compound, it just makes it into a non-electrolyte. It does not dissociate when it when you uh, put it in solution. When you bubble, if you have one of these uh, pieces of equipment at home where you have little little uh, it's called uh, what do you call it? you want to make uh, carbonated water? Yeah, these little vials of carbon dioxide it boils right through. Well, you can do the same thing with straw. Just blow into <laughs> blow into your water you'll see a pH change on you because you're blowing carbon dioxide into the water, forms carbonic acid. But the point being that carbon dioxide is not soluble in water. Otherwise, when you shake your soda pop, you wouldn't see that soda pop but fizzle. It starts to go out. It's in solution, kind of pseudo dissolved, but not totally 100% dissolved, just sitting in there. Most gases do that, which is good for the fish. Oxygen does the same. That's how they get oxygen in their body because of the oxygen that's in the water. All right, so it's covalent. Next one, number six. Right at the top, sodium, part of the big four. It is a strong electrolyte, specifically a strong base. Why? Because we got a hydroxide. So that makes it a strong base, which makes it a strong electrolyte. It's a strong base because it exhibits solubility in water. All right, number seven, calcium carbonate. Okay, this is where it helps to start learning the names of these so you can learn to go and get more information about that compound, calcium carbonate. So the carbonate part should send you to the solubility rules and look for the uh, carbonate part on the solubility rules. And you'll find that it is insoluble when it's bonded to calcium, okay? Therefore, it makes it a weak electrolyte. Number eight, it's made up of nothing but uh, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, basically what we call an, an organic compound. Okay. And uh, being all carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen tells you I have a covalent species here. Therefore, it is a non electrolyte. If the covalent species was an acid like HCl, then we would have an electrolyte, either a strong or a weak one. Okay. But it's not the case here. All right, number nine, right at the top, sodium phosphate. You got sodium, okay? Automatically, 
soluble. Therefore, it's a strong electrolyte. Okay. All right, then finally, number 10, you see lead PB up front. That's a flag to tell you, maybe I have an, an insoluble. Not all leads are insoluble, but that gives you an idea of where to look for because the next thing is the sulfate, okay? And you read in the solubility rules that when lead is combined with sulfate, it is insoluble. Therefore, makes it a weak electrolyte. Okay. So that's that's how we did this. Is if it's an ionic compound, go look up its solubility rules. If it's a covalent compound. Obviously, it would be a non-electrolyte unless it's a covalent acid, okay? And then you need to determine whether it's a strong acid or a weak acid. All right, so that being said, congratulations. You have completed chapter nine. And you have any questions? Well, I tell you what, let's take a quick 15 minute break and then we will continue with Tech 10. Unless you have questions when we come back. So I have 120, let's, let's call it 135. Okay. 135, we'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Um, before I continue, any questions over what we just covered? All right, well, let's no questions. Let's jump into chapter 10. Okay. <clears throat> now we just got introduced to a particular type of reaction, and that was a neutralization reaction. Um, so where we had the combination of an acid and a base coming together to neutralize each other, okay? The thing about a neutralization reaction is when you get a proton and hydroxide coming together, the product you always get is water, okay? You neutralized it, you neutralize the acid and the base. Now there are six types. We got all, you know, you think all the chemistry that's involved, you would think to be more, but there's only six types of reactions. One of them we just introduced you to at least five. The other one, which you may have done today, if you drove your vehicle today, uh, you did a combustion reaction, you were burning some fuel. Okay, combustion reaction deals with the reaction of a hydrocarbon, which is a a <clears throat> a chemical that is a compound is made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen, hydrocarbon reacted with oxygen, okay? If you, if you plan to cook this weekend on the barbecue using propane, that's a combustion reaction, okay? Anyway, but before we continue, let's talk about conservation matter, which I introduced a little bit about when we talked about balancing the reactions, okay? Matter is, is neither created or destroyed. It's basically just rearranged. It's put into different forms. Okay. The, the conservation matter tells us that the total mass of reactants uh, at the end, when it's when it's made the products, the mass of reactants will add up to the total mass of products. So if I start off with 100 grams of reactants, whatever the case may be, whatever they are, at the end when I Convert it to something else, all the mass of all the products should add up to 10 grams. Okay. Uh, I used to be able to do, I can't do it here, but a demonstration where I would take a little beaker, little Erlenmeyer flask, which contained a little bit of vinegar. Okay. And then I would put a balloon over it. But inside the balloon, before anything, I would add some uh, baking soda. 
and then let the put it over the lip of the flask and let the baking soda with the balloon hang on the side. Then take that whole unit and put it on a balance and weigh everything. So you have the liquid vinegar, which is acetic acid. And then you had the baking soda with sodium bicarbonate in the in the in the uh, balloon hanging on the edge on the side there, and weigh the whole thing and be whatever about whatever weight it was. And then you take the balloon and just tilt it up, lift it up, and the baking soda will fall inside and react with the acetic acid to produce carbon dioxide. And the balloon fills up with carbon dioxide. And you leave it on the balance where that process occurs and you start off with 20 grams. Guess what, after a few minutes, you still got 20 grams. It sometimes went a little bit less because the connection wasn't the best connection of the, of the, of the uh, balloon to the neck of the flask, but it surely demonstrated the conservation of metal, okay? So another way to say that is that if I start off in this case, you know, 254 arbitrary carbon atoms, that at the end, I will have 254 carbon atoms, totally in a different form, but they're still going to be there. Okay. And when that occurs, we have what's called a balanced chemical reaction. I introduced that when we were doing the one, the example of an acid in the base, trying to define which was which was the arrhenius acid, which was the arrhenius base. Remember that one in the previous chapter? And there was a two in front of nitric acid, okay? And we needed two protons to react with the two hydroxides react uh, coming from the calcium hydroxide. So, which produced uh, two, Water. So let me let me redo that so you can re refresh your memory. Call we had that example of two nitric acids reacting with a calcium hydroxide. Okay, which gave us two waters plus calcium nitrate. And if oh, that's a two. Sorry about that. And if we go, we went through that exercise to demonstrate that we have. A total of four hydrogens on the left, four hydrogens on the right. Okay, different forms, but nevertheless, still hydrogen. Okay, so it's a balanced chemical weight equation, and we need a balanced chemical equation here because we're going to take from that um, information that we're going to use in calculations further down the road here. Now, some of these chemical reactions that we're going to talk about to balance them, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately and unfortunately. Fortunately, there's small, simple equations and not very complicated. And so the way we balance them is basically by trial and error, okay? We, we put a two here, see how that works, maybe move a three over there back and forth. And, uh, but fortunately, the fortunately part is they're not that complicated, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, to balance them by putting coefficients there back and forth. The others, we have set systems. Some reactions have a set system, which we'll go over. This is how we balance them, balance them correctly, okay? I'll demonstrate that when we get to it. Well, balancing chemical reactions. What we do first is we write the chemical reaction, making sure the chemical formulas are correct, okay? And so here we go. We we started with the elements, remember, and then we got the we had the uh, ions, and we start putting the ions together. And now we're reacting the compound to make compounds. And now we're reacting them, and we talked about naming them, right? Naming the compounds. And I stated, learn to give it a name, write the formula, and vice versa. Because here we are. Okay, so taking all that and putting it together now. Little by little. So we got to write the chemical reaction. And most of the time we're given a reaction in words, and we need to convert those words into a chemical reaction. Uh, then, then once we do that for both reactants and products, then we balance it up. And we put numbers in front, the coefficients, so that things get balanced out. All right. For example, 
uh, these coefficients. Now remember, we don't change the subscripts. The subscripts are etched in stone. Those we don't change. We can change the coefficients in any number into any number, but the, but the coefficient, the subscripts, we leave alone because that is the ratio that the atoms come together to make that compound. Okay, the coefficients, the big numbers, not the subscripts, tell us how many of those compounds are needed for whatever reason, you know, we need them for. So and if there's no number in front of them, it's understood to be a one, just like in mathematics and algebra. And so this says that I have two hydrogen atoms, molecules, reacting with one molecule of oxygen to generate two molecules of water, okay? And if we break it apart so we can see, see them, you can see we have four, a total of four hydrogens denoted by the, the dark color, the gray color, four of them, okay? And then the oxygens, we've got two of them denoted by the white color. So when they react, they generate a new product, which is water. And so now oxygen, we make H2O. We've still got four hydrogens now in the form of water, and we still have two oxygens now in the form of water, okay? And so the coefficient tells us we have two molecules of water, two molecules of hydrogen, and one molecule of oxygen. And that is our coefficient. That is a balanced chemical reaction. Mother Nature is happy, okay? Yeah, and this this is a, a, a whole chapter called stoichiometry, but it's it's necessary to when we do calculations. But we're familiar with stoichiometry. We know that, for example, we have a car that requires four tires, excluding the spare. But it requires four tires. We got a four wheel car, right? So that relationship is a four to one ratio. If you have a bicycle two-wheel bicycle, it's a two-to-one ratio. That's a bicycle frame to the tire. If you have a unicycle, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. If you have a tricycle, obviously, it's a three-to-one ratio, okay? That's what we call stoichiometry, okay? Anyway, we need to learn to balance the chemical reactions. So let's take these, for example, this reaction. And uh, fortunately, in this example, we have they've taken the, form, the formula they gave it to you. Sometimes they may be written in words. It may say things like uh, the reaction of nitrogen gas in the presence of hydrogen gas gives ammonia. Okay. And one takes that information in, in words and converts it to a chemical reaction. All right. So now we got to balance it. And like I said, some of these reactions are, are simple. We don't have, they're not that complicated. And so we, we got to break it down. Now, which one you want to pick to start with hydrogen nitrogen really doesn't make a difference at times, okay? But I want you to, I'm going to rewrite this for a second. So we've got nitrogen plus hydrogen gives us NH3, which hopefully you know now you recognize as ammonia. Okay, now note we have, let's do an inventory of everything to begin with. To begin with, we have two nitrogens, two hydrogens, and on the uh, reactant side, and on the product side, we have one nitrogen and three hydrogens, okay? So that's initially. Finally, we need to adjust it so everybody's even. Now, when we look at the reaction, we could do a couple of things. Okay, we can note that we got two nitrogens on the left-hand side. Now, a thing about balancing, normally you can you start on one side. Sometimes you start on the product side, sometimes you start on the reacting side. When you do that, you put a number on one side or the other. What that does, it triggers a number 
the requirement for another atom. So you got to go back to the other side to change that number. So you go back and forth as needed, such that everything's balanced. Okay. So in this case, we're going to start with the nitrogen. We got two nitrogens on the left hand side, but only one on the right hand side. What that does, if I put a two in front of ammonia, okay, that changes me to, uh, I can change that to two nitrogens now, right? On the right side, which balances out the nitrogens. But what that does, that kicks up my three hydrogens now to six, see? And so now my six hydrogens go up. What I need to do now is to balance my hydrogen. So I go back to the reactant site. And if I put a three, in front of hydrogen, that gives me a tell you one from a two from two hydrogens to six. Guess what? I'm balanced here. I got two nitrogens, six hydrogens on the reactant side, two nitrogens on the product side, and six hydrogens on the product side. Okay. Mother Nature is happy. I have a, a balanced chemical reaction of one nitrogen molecule requires three molecules of hydrogen to give me two molecules of ammonia. Let me clear this up for a second. Okay, there's a two, three, and I have that. Okay, another way to look at that is to actually draw them up. I got two nitrogens, I got three hydrogens, and all that gives me two ammonias. So you can see I got two hydrogen, nitrogens, two nitrogens, total of six hydrogens, total of six in the product side, okay? All right. Another one. Okay, we have here, we have hydrogen in the presence of bromine, gives me hydrogen bromide. Okay. Notice I didn't call it hydrobromic acid because hydrobromic acid, which is HBr, like hydrochloric acid would have to be an aqueous solution. So uh, hydrobromic acid acid versus hydrogen bromide when it's a gas. This is an acid when it's mixed with water, okay? All right, so here it's pretty, pretty straightforward here because notice I got two hydrogens on the left, two bromides, you know, two BRs. I call it, I say BRs because on the left is bromine, on the right is bromide. So to keep it from being ambiguous, I'm calling it just two BRs on the left, one BR on the right. What if I put a two in front of HBR? Okay, that means that my hydrogens are taken care of and my BRs are taken care of. It looks like I have a balanced chemical equation. Okay. And I'm balanced. Okay. Now, the next one, you have carbon monoxide in the presence of oxygen creates carbon and dioxide. Okay. Notice that again, I wrote in, in English, it could be, I mean, in, in words, it could be written as follows carbon monoxide in the presence of oxygen yields carbon dioxide. Taking those words, working backwards, you can write that formula. Okay. Um, here we have a couple ways you can look at. So far, we these type of examples is basically trial and error, unfortunately. Okay, these other ones we're going to have are going to be more specific. So, what if I don't know? You can do this now. One one word about this. Let's say about you you played with the numbers. You went back and forth, back and forth, and for whatever reason, 
you double everything. Let's say you end up with four here, two here, and two here for the previous example. Okay, yes, that's balance, okay? But as in mathematics, what you wanna do is bring those coefficients down to their lowest uh, ratio. So even though it's balanced two, two, and four, it's not brought down to the lowest ratio. Everyone's divisible by two. So you take that number and it does happen sometimes you end up with the number like two, two, and four, but check at the end whether I can reduce that numbers even further. And when you do that, you end up with that. That would be a correct balanced chemical reaction. Okay, for the next one, um, there are a couple of things you can do. Um, I don't know, you can put a two in front of carbon dioxide, okay? And what that does is that kicks up my carbon count. So I got to put a two on the left side, okay? Now, if I look at my oxygen side, I got two in the form of carbon monoxide and two in the form of oxygen, as far as oxygen is concerned. And I got two copper, uh, carbons on both sides, so it certainly looks like it's balanced, okay? All right, so here we're given the, the uh, formulas and then we're asked to balance it. But like I stated, you may be writing the reactions from words, okay? And remember to include physical states, which then brings us to way back when we were looking at the physical states of the elements to, unless you're told otherwise, in the words, you know, go back and refresh your memory as to which uh, elements were liquids, which were gases, and which were, were um, um, solid, all right? So to be able to include the physical state, okay? And S, L, G, and A, Q. All right, remember which elements solids, liquid, and gas. And more importantly, <laughs> is remember the ones that were diatomic. You know, there's only seven of them. Have no fear of ice cold beverage, okay? Remember that? Okay, because they may say hydrogen gas. Well, you may want to, if you say hydrogen gas, taking the words, and you simply just write H. Oh. If you just write H and then just say G, well, that would be incorrect, right? Because we know that hydrogen is diatomic. So that would be incorrect. So you have to remember that that, that is diatomic. Same will be with chlorine and bromine and oxygen and so forth, okay? Unless they say hydrogen atom, which is gonna be unlikely. You got, they're, they're gonna say hydrogen gas or uh, uh, oxygen gas, so on and so forth. Highly unlikely they'll say the atom and then obviously then the top one would be correct, but that's very unlikely. Okay, this is a, a reminder that the subscripts, once you, you know, how many, we got those set, we leave those alone. That's the ratio of the, how many atoms come together to form that particular compound, whatever it may be. And the coefficient tells us how many molecules of that compound that we have. We can change that coefficient any number of times that we need, okay? All right, so here we have a, reaction in words and we need we need to convert it to a chemical reaction and so what we have here is sodium reacts so let's let's write down sodium is n a now they didn't say anything else all they say was just sodium so we're talking about the element okay and and it's a metal and and it's a solid i should say because of the metals, there's, there's only one that's a liquid and none of them are gases, right? So it's a solid. The, re, the key word reacts with, that tells you the plus sign. So sodium reacts with, or sodium in the presence of, okay? Those are key words that tell you plus. And then we got chlorine, okay? 
Right, CL, which we know is diatomic, okay? And produces, key word, produces, yields, makes, that's the key word for the reaction arrow. So following that would be the product. Now, here we have an ionic compound. Before I write it down, first write it in ionic form. We know that sodium chloride is, sodium is a plus form and the chloride is a negative one, okay? So I write it in ionic form, assures me that I put them together so that I have enough of each to cancel their respective charge. So it's a one-to-one -one in this scenario and it's a solid, okay? Now the next thing we do is we balance it. So we got one sodium here, one sodium here. We got two CLs on the left, one CL on the right. What if we put a two in front of sodium chloride where well, that balances my chlorides and chlorine, okay? But it kicks up my sodium. So I just simply come back to the reactant site and put a two in front of sodium. Now I have a balanced chemical reaction. Right. And that's what I just wrote. Oh, I forgot to write the physical state of chlorine. So I'm just a gas, right? So I got out of my states. Okay. Now I balance it. Okay. Uh, no, this is an interesting question here is asking you know, why is it not NaCl2? I hope you recognize that sodium is a group one element. So sodium will become a plus one ion. This suggests that sodium will be a plus two, which is not the case because sodium is not in group two, it's in group one, it has one valence electron only. So it can't be um, NaCl2. Okay, so we balance it, we've got two sodiums react with chlorine to give you sodium chloride. Very interesting reaction, by the way, because we have sodium metal right here, which is extremely reactive for the atmosphere. In fact, it's so reactive that it has to be stored in mineral oil. Keep it away, because the moment it touches water, it reacts violently. Uh, and you may find some uh, examples on the internet where people take chunks of sodium metal and throw it into a stream or throw it into a, the lake or something, quite aggressive reaction. Then you have chlorine gas, which is a poison. They used uh, some municipalities, the water treatment plants use chlorine to get rid of bacteria, but it is a poisonous gas. So if you live near one, be careful if they're using it, be careful. Uh, and you ever see a, a, a yellow, greenish cloud uh, get upstream quickly because they got a chlorine leak, okay? And these two react together and they end up making a product that you could put on your french fries, which is, you know, not that hazardous unless you got, you know, uh, high blood pressure and you got to keep away from your sodium ion content, okay? And, and the fascinating thing is one reason I got into chemistry is the exchange is the exchange of two electrons, two little old electrons. Remember those electrons? It we basically has no mass. They're so small that they behave like light. And the exchange of two electrons results in, in this reaction. It's quite, quite amazing. the power of electrons. All right, so here we have another example where we are taking aluminum, okay, uh, reacting with a bromine to produce solid sodium bromide. And so we write down the reactants. We know aluminum, its symbol is Al. Bromine, notice the word bromine, I-N-E, tells you we're dealing with the element. 
and specifically it is diatomic, so it's Br2, and then aluminum bromide. So to make sure we got the right formula, take this, write the ions first, before I put them together, just like we did before. I'm gonna put them together, but I wanna make sure that I put them together with the correct number of each. So aluminum has a plus three. Why do I, how do I know that? It's a metal, it will lose electrons, obviously, and it's in group 3A. So it's three valence electrons. It's gonna lose those three valence electrons and give me a plus three charge. The bromide is uh, in group seven. As it is a nonmetal, it's going to gain electrons, specifically one, to give us a net negative one charge. I put these together, I need three bromides for every aluminum plus three, okay, to give us solid aluminum bromide. All right. So always, always write the ions first before you put them together, because you don't want to assume aluminum bromide, you write B. ALBR and you're done. That's, that would be incorrect. Okay. Um, the physical states aluminum is uh, a metal, obviously, and it's a solid. Uh, and there's only, uh, again, only one liquid solid. Anybody remember which metal was liquid? We used to use it in thermostats quite a bit. Anyway, you might check, you might check that table to show the physical states of the elements. All right, so we got aluminum, bromine, a liquid, and then the product aluminum bromide. Now we got to balance it. Okay. Now here's a little hint when you get this kind of scenario. Um, I have three bromides on the left reacted site, excuse me, two, and three on the product side, okay? What I need to do here, like we were doing before, we're looking for a common number. I can make, determine a common number be, between the BRs, and that common number would be six, right? Just like we did before, remember when we were putting together the, uh, uh, we were putting together calcium, and the nitride. Okay, we're looking for a common number. In this case, with six. Well, here's an, another application where we're looking for a common number. So if I put a three bromide bromines, and I put a two in front of aluminum bromide, I now have my BRs balanced because I got six BRs over here and six over here. Okay. Well, in doing and putting the two in front of the aluminum bromide, they kicked up my aluminum. No big deal. Okay. Come back to aluminum, put a two in front of it. And now it's balanced. Okay. It is balanced. And we have the following balance equation. That relationship is for reactants which is telling you this. I have two aluminums for every three bromines that I react with. That relationship is a ratio. Remember back when we were doing conversions and we said that ratio of one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. I can write it with centimeters in top or centimeters in the bottom. This is the ratio here that I can do the same thing. So I can write that ratio with three BR on top and two aluminum in the bottom, or invert it, two aluminum on top and three BR in the bottom, okay? Because now, let's say for example, the question says, if I have six, aluminums to react, how many BRs do I need, right? If I have six aluminums to begin with, quite, oh, 
and then reach this. Question, how many BRs do I need? Notice how I set that problem up, just like we were doing our conversion factors way back then with units. Using that ratio system, we're back, we're, we're here. So that means here, if I got six BRs, I want to uh, six aluminums, I want to know how many BRs. Well, obviously I want the aluminum has to be in the denominator and the BRs has to be in the numerator, right? And this relationship is from the balanced chemical equation. So it's three to two, okay? And so that being the case, I need nine bromines for every six, if I got six to work with, okay? And I did that using this, these ratios right here. And these ratios came from the balanced chemical equation, okay? And I just used the example of B aluminum, but I could have asked the question, if I have six, six BRs, bromines, how many aluminums do I need? Well, I'll do the same scenario using this, this one here on the right. If I have six BRs, okay, I'll just need four aluminums, okay? And I'm just doing the reactants, but I can expand that to the products. If I have six aluminums, how many aluminum bromides will I make? Well, I got six aluminums. The ratio of aluminum to the aluminum bromide is two to two. So I just write that ratio. If my units cancel, that means, and my numbers cancel, so that means I will make six aluminum bromides. Okay, if I start off with six aluminums. And that is a true statement, whether I start with six or I start with six billion. That ratio is the same, okay? And, uh, and now we use it either for six or six billion. All right. So that is why these, these uh, conversion factors are necessary. The ratio that is, we need to balance them correctly because if we don't balance them correctly, then this number will be incorrect. All right. So let us continue. All right, so in, in uh, essence, first write, when you're given a reaction in words, first write the reaction with proper formulas. Um, okay, then once you do that, don't forget the, uh, the uh, physical states. And then we do a balance, balance them up, okay? And here's, this is why, uh, what we do now, we have that ratio there that we can use to calculate do calculations. So go refresh your memory on how you did you were converting units from inches to meters using the units to keep track of. Because eventually you're gonna be you're gonna be having at least at the minimum three conversion factors, you know, to go from apples to oranges. Remember that extreme example I gave you right, where I dealt with DH students versus, I think it was bananas or something, okay? Very extreme. They look like they're unrelated, but I can convert from one to the other if I have conversion factors. And these conversion factors, in this case, come from the balanced chemical equation. Okay, here's one. The reaction of phosphorus reacting with oxygen to make solid diphosphorus pentoxide, okay? All right, let's, let's break this one down. All right, the reaction of phosphorus, which will be P, right? Reacting with, which means the plus, oxygen, which is the O2, 
okay? Because we know it's diatomic. To make, which is our key for the arrow, okay? To make or yields or any type of word, words, a combination of words and tell you those two react, I'm gonna make this product. Now we're gonna make solid diphosphorus pentoxide. Okay, this is where the nomenclature comes into play because now we're given a name, we gotta write the, we gotta write the uh, formula. And if you recall, this is a, a covalent compound and I suggest that first you write the parent formula, phosphorus, which is P and oxide, which is O. So it's PO is a basic parent formula. Now write the prefixes, penta, which is five, and di, which is two. And so we got P2O5, okay? All right. As the previous example of the aluminum and uh, bromine, remember we had a two to, two to three disparity in the, bro in the bromines? Very similar here, but we got a two to five. So what if, what if I, um, as a general guide, as a two, if I have a monatomic element, leave that alone for last. You got something diatomic, work on that. If there are two diatomics, we'll pick either one to work with first. But if you have a monatomic element, leave it alone for last and work on the other one. So I got uh, two oxygens on the left, five on the right. Well, I got that similar ratio scenario. So what if I put a five in front of oxygen? That means I put a two in front of P2O5 because um, that gives me 10 oxygens on both sides, okay? Well, then that means that my phosphorus, my P, got kicked up to four. Well, no, no problem. I put a four in front of P there, and now I'll go back and check. I got four, four phosphorus here. I got 10 oxygens on the left side, okay? I got four phosphorus here, and I got 10 oxygens on the right side. I'm balanced. Perfectly balanced there, okay? Yeah, I totally forgot to put, the, I keep forgetting to put the, the states. Don't forget the states, okay? And then I'm about to, now here's that ratio. I need four phosphorus, okay? Four of them for every five oxygen to give me two molecules of P2O5. Okay? And now I got a ratio. In fact, you know, I've introduced it early, but that's okay. I got a relationship ratio between the two reactants, okay? But I also have a relationship between the phosphorus and the product, which is four to two. And then I have a relationship between the oxygen and the product, which is a five to two, okay? Each one, each relationship, I can have two ratios. I got a total of six ratios here that I can write. And depending, and depending on the question, I'm gonna use one or the other, for example. I got 4P over 5O2. I can invert that. Where I got 5O2 over 4P. Okay. Then I got the 4 phosphorus over the 2P2O5. That relationship. Or I can invert that 2P2O5 over 4P. Okay. And then obviously I got the 5 oxygen over the 2. P2O5 or invert that. So I got two P2O5 over the five oxygen. Okay. So I have six conversion factors in that simple equation that relates both the reactants with each other, one of the reactants with the product, and then the other reactant with the product. And depending on the question asked, I can use one of these six to get me to my answer, okay? All right. Here's, here's a hard problem. Um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and work it through. But, um, because this is a, this is a uh, type of another type of reaction, which we call a, uh, a double displacement reaction, okay? And I'll explain more on that here in a bit. But first, let's write it out. It seems complicated, but, you know, go back to basics, break it down, all right? We have nickel three sulfate plus lead two nitrate produces nickel three nitrate and solid two sulfate, okay? Sounds complicated and, and it could be, but if you break it down and remember what those Roman numerals meant and also go back and refresh your memory on the polyatomic ions, with sulfate, okay, and nitrate, we talked at length about those, okay? We know the simple for nickel, which is Ni, okay? And lead, which is Pb. The Roman numerals apply to the oxidation state of the metals. So let's take the first one and clear this up and break them down into the ions first so that we put them together properly, okay? And so we got nickel three, which tells you that you are working with nickel plus three. And then the next one is sulfate. So sulfate, go to the polyatomic ion table and its formula is SO4 negative two, okay? All right, so that means let's put these, let's put this together in the right ratio. So I got nickel three, which is a plus three and the sulfate is a negative two. And so here we have a disparity of a plus three and a negative two. Remember what we did? We looked for a common factor. In this case here, as the other ones we did, common factor six. So this means I need three nickels for every two sulfates, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's write the formula. So we've got nickel three parentheses SO4 two, okay? All right, plus, it says right there, plus, so, lead two nitrate. So lead two is Pb plus two, okay? And the nitrate go to the polyatomic table and you'll see that's an NO3 negative one, okay? Let's put them together. Well, I have a plus two and a negative one. So that means that I need two nitrates. I need, it's a polyatomic ion, need two, I got to put parentheses. So I write P, B, parentheses, N, O, three. Okay. Two, excuse me, N, O, three, two. All right. Now, next thing, produces, that's your keyword for the arrow. Produces. So now, we're still dealing with nickel two, three, excuse me, it's a plus three, and nitrate. So that we, we put together NO3, negative one, right? So then we need three nitrates for every nickel plus three. So we got Ni parentheses NO3. Okay, so far, any questions so far? You following along? Okay, then finally, this is the keyword N, we're telling you solid. Lead to sulfate, okay? So we got lead to, we haven't changed the oxidation state anymore, and sulfate, which is SO4, negative two, okay? We combine these two, we have PBSO4 solid. 
Okay. So you see that we, we took the words and broke them down into the ions so that we can put them together in the proper ratio to, to write the formula for that particular compound. And then we took other keywords like plus and tell us that's one reactant plus the other reactant, and then produces telling us that's where the arrow goes, and then the solids, then not the solids, then the products, and then and tells you there's two products. And means I got one product and another product. Okay. And they tell you that one of them is solid. Now, if we look at the solubility rules for the other products, reactants, you'll find that the reactants are both soluble, aqueous. Nitrates, regardless, remember the nitrates, everybody, who, whatever you tie up with the nitrates, it is soluble, so that's an aqueous. Sulfates too, uh, nickel, uh, Sulfate, looking at the solubility rule, rules, will show you that it is also soluble. Okay. And then again, the, the nickel nitrate, also soluble. Again, for the same rule, all nitrates are soluble regardless of what the metal is. And then they tell you that you have one solid product. Now, notice what happened in this reaction. You start off with nickel sulfate and you end up with lead sulfate. It looks, it, what it looks like, think, look, look at it carefully. The cations exchange partners with the other anion, okay? So the nickel exchange partners with the lead nitrate and now have lead, uh, nickel nitrate, and then you've got lead combining with the uh, sulfate to give you lead sulfate. So partners exchange. Then we look at the solubility rules of the products and you will see that lead sulfate is insoluble. And so you have two reactants, the nickel sulfate and the lead nitrate, which are soluble and clear solutions. And then the moment you mix them together, you get a precipitate, you get a solid. And that's a positive reaction because the new partners that exchange one of them, one of them is insoluble in water and then forms a precipitate. Okay, and that's that's a good way to uh, uh, check for uh, sulfates in your water, and or check for nitrates and that nitrates uh, sulfates and and lead in your water by doing this type of test. You get a cloudy solution. That's because of the lead sulfate combined. And lead sulfate, you know, they combine with each other arbitrarily in solution, but because the, the, the property of lead sulfate is such that it is insoluble, it stays together and precipitates. Okay, so you have a positive reaction. All right, so that's how, what we did. Now you might ask, how can I balance this thing? Okay. This is called a double, an example of a double displacement reaction. For these types of reactions, follow, I repeat, follow the polyatomic ions and the corresponding everything else just falls in place, okay? For example, I have two sulfates to begin with in the beginning in the form of nickel, nitri nickel sulfate, right? And then you got lead nitrate where I got two nitrates there. Well, I got two nitrates on the left side and three in the right side. A disparities, okay? What if I do the same scenario? Common factor is, is uh, uh, six. So what if I put a two in front of, let me change the color so we can see it get a little crazy there. What if I put a two in front of lead nitrate and a three in front of nickel nitrate? Okay, doesn't that balance out the nitrates? Now I got, what did I do? Oh, sorry, I did that backwards. <laughs> uh, 
I meant to put a three. Let me clear up my mess here. because I got two nitrates here and three here. And so if I put three, ledge, and two here, that takes care of my nitrates, right? And like, oh, something went amok here. Let me clear my mess up. Yeah, that was, that was right. I was at that point. <laughs> and so before that, I had uh, three over here. So I put a three here, and then I put a two here to take care of the nitrates. Okay. Then I had three sulfates, that's what happened. I, I was putting two down here, so I was off. So that's why it's why it's so important that you write the formulas correctly. So I got three sulfates here. So I put a three in front of lead sulfate that takes care of the sulfates. My leads are taken care of. And my nickels, just by default, they come into place. So they balance it themselves out by following the polyatomic ions to balance things out. Okay, so try this one on your own again. Uh, see if you can follow what I did on your own. See if you come up with that same answer. So now, uh, this is an example of a double displacement reaction in which you have two reactants, two reactants that are that are oh, two reactants that are soluble. Okay. And then the respective cations and anions exchange partners. And because the nature of the beast of the new combination, if one of them that come together exhibits insoluble properties in water, it would cause a precipitate. Okay. And that is an indication of a positive reaction when you get a precipitate. If both of the products had were soluble based on the solubility rules, then there would be no reaction because all they did was just exchange partners and go back and forth and uh, no, no product is formed, okay? All right, so let's talk about the specific types of reactions. Some of the, this is this is what it, what it is is general <coughs> excuse me formulas and general types of reactions. Okay, the first one is called the combination, where and what you have is basically you start off with two elements. Okay, keyword I start off with two elements and they combine together and they form a compound. Notice a element plus B element combined to form AB, which is a compound. By definition, a compound is made up of two or more different elements, okay? Now, the opposite of a combination reaction is a decomposition. So if you take that compound, in this, in this example, ABC, and you do something to it and you break it back down to the elements, that is a decomposition reaction. So in this case, the compound ABC is broken back down to the elements A, B, and C, whatever they, they may be, okay? Combustion reaction. All right, this is something that uh, I explained earlier if you're driving a vehicle you have in general terms, carbon and hydrogen, with the X subscript X and subscript Y. These are whole numbers and these are a general formula. Now, we, we show with respect to combustion reaction, hydrocarbons, okay? 
These are compounds that are made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen. That's it. Now we're going to things like you're familiar with uh, gasoline, fuel, there's a variety of different hydrocarbons in there. Uh, if you have a lighter, you have a butane lighter that's made up of carbon and hydrogen. This weekend, if you're going to do a little cookout with gas, you're going to be using propane. So you have butane, propane, A and E, made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen. Okay. In order for anything to burn, to combust, what is what is that we need? We need oxygen. So oxygen in the combustion reaction is a requirement. It's a reactant. So you may be given the combustion of hydrocarbon X, whatever it may be, gives you, uh, let me restate it this, let me finish before I continue. Now for Chem 130, Chem 130, the combustion of hydrocarbons is only going to give you two products, carbon dioxide and water. Okay. Now we know that uh, that's not 100% true. Hence, you wouldn't have carbon monoxide as one of your gases coming out of your exhaust of your vehicle. But that's simply because the inefficiency of our engines that can't uh, combust your, the fuel efficiently. Okay. So uh, that being the case, yes, we're familiar with that. But for CAM 130, the combustion of hydrocarbons requires oxygen as one of the reactants, and the only two products that you will see is carbon dioxide and water. Okay? Occasionally, if you're driving in front of and behind a vehicle and you look at the tailpipe, there's liquid coming out, or if you look at yours, maybe after you sat for a while and you got liquid coming out, what that is is water. Okay, and then carbon dioxide obviously goes into the atmosphere. All right. So that is an example of a combustion reaction. All right, acid-base reaction. We talked about a whole chapter in this, where you have an acid, which is the proton generator creator, reacting with the base from an or, uh, ionic a hydroxide compound to give you water and salt, whatever salt it is. Okay. All right. So um, next type. Will be what's called a single replacement. Now, if you look at this, you start off with a metal elemental metal, okay? And you react it with an ionic compound, which has a metal, but it is in ionic form. Look what's happened. The metal A exchanged places with the metal M. So now you've created a new ionic compound, MX. And then that metal, which was in ionic form, is back to elemental form, okay? We're gonna be able to predict this. And why is that? Because you have access to the infamous periodic table, okay? And if we look at this section right here, right above the solubility rules, it's a series called activity series in which you're gonna, we have a set questions that we ask about that reaction and if how the answer comes up will tell you whether that reaction I just showed will occur or not okay and so we, we become familiar with it so what this is saying is that lithium metal is a lot more reactive than gold gold is way over here in the far right which is true gold is very unreactive it's one of the reasons gold is called the, a noble metal, because it, it doesn't mean it cannot react. We can react gold, but it takes a vigorous conditions. And that is one reason gold that was buried thousands of years ago comes out today, and it's still shiny as the day it was put away, okay? because it's so unreactive. Anyway, 
Well, take a look at this. Another classic example of this is plating. If you have uh, jewelry that's been plated, normally you start off with the metal that you want to plate on whatever you're going to plate in ionic form and you run it through the process and that metal which was in ionic form now becomes elemental form okay and the other metal which was in elemental form now goes to ionic form and is driven by the activity series. So we'll be able to predict where the reaction proceeds just by simply answering some questions about the reaction. And then the example I just, we did earlier with the nitrate and the sulfate, that is a double replacement reaction. And in here, look at the general formula. We have metal one, whatever it may be, doesn't mean there's only one metal. What this is showing, this is one type of metal. Like earlier, this could have been uh, lead, and this metal too could be nickel. Okay, and so what's happening? Metal metal X exchanges uh, the anion with metal Y. So now metal one now is metal Y and metal two now is metal X. So the anions and cations have exchanged position. If one of these based on the solubility rules is soluble, okay? If one of the products is soluble or is insoluble, excuse me, then you have a positive reaction, okay? If both of the products are soluble based on the solubility rules, then there's no reaction because nothing happened. You just exchange partners and that's it. Okay, and they go back and forth, back and forth. All right, so those are the six types of reactions that we uh, will deal with. Okay, and the next few pages is we're going to talk about specific types of reactions. Okay, so I got uh, 240. I will stop it here, and that is um, slide number 11, chapter 10. All right, let me stop it here.